All right. Hey, Scott, thanks for joining us. Hey, Danny. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So everybody on the Flipping Junkie podcast today, I've got Scott Smith, Scott Royal Smith, who owns, who founded and owns Royal Legal Solutions in Austin, Texas. So he's just right up the road from me. Uh, welcome to the show. Yeah, uh, great to be here, Danny. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, it's um, I understand you guys do a lot of house flipping, um, so I'm excited to tell you guys today about how you can you know do your flipping and make sure you never have any skeletons in the closet that come back to bite you. Since flipping is inherently the most risky types of investments you can do with real estate, um, it I think I have some good stuff for you guys today. Awesome. Yeah, I remember early on whenever I was first getting started, that was always one of those concerns for me and I have those nightmares where I'd wake up in the middle of the night wondering if you know the the part of the roof that got rebuilt you know 10 years from now would collapse on somebody you know all that kind of stuff that you know I was younger too but but those are just kind of things that I would worry about and and uh, I know you're talking about asset protection and and uh, we're going to cover some of these uh, maybe stories hopefully we've got some stories from people that have experienced something and you know to to help other people out there to not make the same mistakes that maybe you've seen made or and ways to just prevent certain mistakes that you've heard of. Yeah, I got some great stories for you guys. And there's really just a couple of basic things that you have to do um, to just eliminate 99% of all of the risks, right? So um, can't wait to dive into to all of that <laughs> out here as we get going. Yeah, let's start with, with your story, Scott. Um, how did you get into, you know, why did you start your business? What, what led you to do that? Well, I owned my first piece of commercial property actually when I was in law school. It was a transmission and auto repair shop. So we bought the building and the business and I did all of the business operations side. And um, my buddy, who was also a law student, um, ran the, the law, the, sorry, the mechanic side of everything. And that was, so that was my first property. And um, then I graduated from law school and started and became a litigation attorney until I realized that everybody in the world who's a litigation attorney absolutely <laughs> hates their life. Uh, and I was like, well, the hell is this? I'm getting out. And so then I jumped out um, and went, to, uh, just started hitting up meetup groups because I always liked real estate and I read like Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That kind of got me onto that track of thinking about it when I was really young. Um, and uh, then found some people there that said, hey, you know, I have this issue that I got, you know, my dad has 55 houses and I don't know really exactly what to do with it. Do you think you can help me? I said, absolutely, I can. <laughs> and then after about two months later, I finally actually knew how to help him. Um, that, was, that was some pretty hard study. And that was the start to the company. I mean, the whole bent of it was saying, how do we have the top level of protection possible um, without complicating our lives, without increasing taxes? Um, and have, you know, streamlined operations, right? So how is it possible to have the best of all worlds? And that's what uh, was the launch of the company with the, the, the essential uh, pieces that we put together for people, um, which I think, which, which actually does, from, from what I can tell, makes us the most competitive law firm in the country in terms of the, the types of protections we offer, how people can scale infinitely at no cost, how they can hide assets, and how it doesn't cost a, you know, arm and leg to do it. Nice. So how, yeah. so, so you guys are focused mainly on real estate investors as clients? hundred percent. A hundred percent of my clients are real estate investors. I've been investing in real estate for about eight years. Um, I only typically will only work with real estate investors. So um, I really, this is the world I live and breathe, right? I don't, I don't handle anything else. Nice. Nice. So if you guys have questions out there and we'll, we'll share later how to get in touch with, with Scott. Um, yeah. I mean, if you've got questions, I'm sure he's knowledgeable and, and can, can help you and save you a lot of hassle from, you know, that's kind of the problem when you're, when you're trying to figure out first, you know, who to talk to, because sometimes you can get different answers from different people. And, uh, you know, with, with uh, legal issues, it's always best to find somebody that specializes and knows the business. And, yeah, understand. and that's especially true, um, Danny. And when you think about what we're talking about with um, company structures and taxation, it goes on. And so we help clients in all 50 states because, because we're so specialized that we're able to do that for real estate investors. And the issue is that you'll find out is that a lot of, when you hear two different opinions online from two really smart people, both people are actually right. Even though their answers conflict it, but they're right answering different assumptions to the question. 
right? Huh. So what it really takes is what we say to people is saying, listen, you know, you can spend a ton of time getting up to speed on all these different issues that are going on for you to like kind of guess if you're right. Or like you can come with us, we'll sign you up for a risk-free consultation that ends up taking you. And then we provide exactly not only the what you need to do, but also answer why is this ideal for your particular situation and not maybe potentially maybe not for somebody else's, right? So, and I would say like, that's the number one rule that I look when I try to hire professionals, because I hire a bunch of CPAs and attorneys myself for my investments, is that I look for one, somebody has to be in the same business I'm in, otherwise it's a no-go. I'm not gonna hire somebody that's like that because they won't really know the ins and outs of what I'm trying to achieve. And the second piece is that they have to be able to explain to me why they're doing what they're doing. You know, like I don't trust anybody, especially when it comes to information, because there's really nobody that, that smart that they can't explain to you what's going on. And if they can't do it, explain it to you why that this is better than the alternative, then really it's the case that they're just not very good at what they're doing. Because they don't oh, really understand point. it to be able to dumb it down to your, you know, to whatever your level is. You know, I could explain this stuff to my five to a five year old if I really needed to. And if you, you can't do that, then you don't understand it. I'd love to see that because I always love when people are able to do that. And you're right. It does show that they, they really know everything inside and out, have a good way of uh, explaining it. Because that is a problem, I think. Whenever I've gone to, to learn some things and get some help with, with legal things, it, it's hard even to understand what's being told to you to be able to, to make a good decision on whether you believe that that's true or that's the way you want to go. And to be able to come up with questions that you might not be thinking about um, that are affected by whatever decisions you're making. So I guess I want to structure this podcast episode to be very useful for the different uh, people in the audience. So if we could, you know, maybe do it in a way where I'm asking you as a house flipper. So most of what I do is house flipping. And mm -hmm. I come to you and say, hey, how can you help me? What are the things I can do to make sure that I'm protecting myself as much as possible? What are the different uh, you know, risks that I have and, and uh, you know, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, Danny, well, I'll tell you that it's the, um, the same strategy we're going to be using for house flipping in terms of company structure for protection is the exact same strategy we're using for buy and hold investors. Nice. So, so what we can do is talk through and we can just, I can kind of point out like, well, you're flipping, you're probably worried about this and this, and this okay. is the way it'll shake out with this type of company structure. And you know, and, and if you're buying and holding, you might be more concerned about this and this, but this is the way it works out for the company structure. So why don't we just take it from the flipping with like, what are your toughest questions? What are the things that you hear the most that um, you think people have a lot of different points of view on or are, you know, are contentious types of issues? Um, and then we can, I can talk you through, you know, what it is that we set up and why. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Well, you probably get a lot more questions about legal things than I oh, do. Okay. Uh, okay. So if you yeah, want to yeah. yeah, just jump in with maybe the common, the most common ones that you're receiving and maybe talk through sort of, you know, your, your approaches to handling those. Yeah. So we usually what I, when I talk to people about, it, I usually what I focus on is like, what are the great ways that we lose money as investors? And, you know, of course there's really good ways to lose money, like jumping into deals before you really have vetted them and before you know what you're doing. Um, trying to jump into a deal solo when you should be joint venturing with somebody who's more experienced um, is a great way to lose money. Um, and one of the other great ways to lose money as an investor is to um, hold property in your personal name or be flipping houses in your personal name. Because when you're holding properties or flipping houses in your personal name, what you're really saying is that if anything goes wrong anywhere in my life, I'm really okay with somebody being able to attack everything that I own. So that's a non-starter for me as an investor and as a business person, um, cause, because what I want is for things to go really wrong and for me to be really okay. Um, and that's what we set up for people is saying, how do we um, set that up? And, and the key phrase here, Danny, is what we focus on in our company and with Royal Legal Solutions is we always separate the assets from the operations. And those are the two main wings of your business. You're always going to have an asset holding company that's going to be the thing that's going to hold all of your cash, it's going to hold your stocks, you know, your personal investments, it's going to hold all of your properties, et cetera. And then you're going to have a totally separate company that we call the operating company. That company handles all of the actual quote unquote business. It's going to have, be involved with all of the contracts, it's going to be involved with hiring um, the people that are going to be working. It's going to be handling your leases. It's going to be doing anything where you would be facing the world and doing business with the world because 
Lawsuits work because there has to be a connection between the thing that somebody's complaining about and the individual they're complaining about, right? That's the nature of it to a five-year-old of what's going on with a lawsuit. If all of your operations are going through this one shell company that we set up, that's who they had the relationship with. And that's who made all the representations. That's the only person they get to sue. They don't get to sue the asset holding company that has that. And then some people say, oh, well, can't you just sue anybody? And they're just going to sue everybody. Yeah, you can. But the way lawsuits work is that typically as a plaintiff, you sue everybody and then a ton of people get dismissed from the lawsuit because you actually have to have what's called a bona fide claim against the individual. So it's not that something can't be named in a suit. It's Will it survive, you know, after the first two weeks of the lawsuit? So, and that's what the operating company does, is it cuts off the liability to you and to your asset holding company and to all the other parties. All right. So how does that work for the investor with the, with the company that's doing operations and then the asset company? So, you know, let's say I'm flipping. And so, you know, how, how, is that, how does that look with the two set with operations and then with assets? Sure. Yeah. So one thing would happen, let's say you're flipping your personal name and you're hiring, like you own the asset, you bought the house, your personal name, and you're hiring all the contractors yourself. You're acting as the GC. So what that would mean is that if anybody um, had a complaint, if the contractor had a complaint, or really anybody had a complaint against you um, connected to that property or an unrelated business or a car accident that exceeded the limits of liability on your insurance policy, that locks up that entire property. Because now they're going to put what's called a Liz pendants on that property and it locks it up with all this litigation, right? So what you would, so that's totally not good. <laughs> Don't want that. So what we, what you would do is, is you would set up a, um, an asset holding company. Typically what we'll use is a series LLC structure. Um, cheapest and best place to set it up is through Texas, but you could also set it up in over 10 different states. And you can use that company anywhere inside the United States, just like any other LLC. And then you would have a completely separate LLC that's there, um, local uh, to you, that would be hiring the contractors, et cetera. So I would say like you, the contractor builds out some cabinets and you're like, these are really crap cabinets, dude. I'm not paying you for them. And it's just no way. And he complains and he says, ah, oh, you're trying to steal from me or whatever. The person who contracted him is the shell LLC. So when he would go to court to sue, he would try to sue this shell LLC. Well, what did you just do? Like he can't sue you. So you're still good. Your credit score and everything is still protected. And he can't sue the asset holding company, which actually owns the property. So then you can still keep running your business, even though there's all this other litigation that quote unquote involves, yeah, involves what you're doing, but it doesn't actually prevent you from running your business and making money. In your worst case scenario, um, likely this lawsuit's not going anywhere. But let's say that he did and he pushed all the way through and spent the $20,000 to push through all the way um, through litigation against this shell LLC, your worst case scenario is that you uh, wind that LLC down and you close it and you just open up a new LLC. So for like under like a thousand dollars, you just take care of that whole problem. Right. It's a really efficient way of getting rid of nuisances. So obviously we're speaking about, you know, the first thing is just running your business properly. And, and you know, that's the best way for asset protection is to not be doing things in a way that's going to get you in trouble first and foremost, asset protection, you know, being something to protect yourself against, you know, some things that happen or, or people that are just out to try to make money from you through litigation. And um, so anyway, I think that's important to be said. I think most people listening probably agree with that. But can, can I jump in there, Danny? Because sure. what you just said is actually really common. I hear a lot and it's, it's, it's not actually the full case because most lawsuits actually happen because of misunderstandings. Like, oddly enough, that's actually real. Most litigation happens. It's really uncommon that people are actually really shady with each other huh. and what they were doing. So especially in the real estate investment you know, community, right? Because it's not like sharky business people that are doing all of this, right? It's most of the time it's because people are misunderstanding because of something with sloppy. So like just to elucidate the point, I'll tell you about one thing that happened with a client of mine is that she ended up buying, having a flip property that she bought and they replaced a bunch of the plumbing that was in the house underneath the floor. Um, so then there was a question about the plumbing. So the, uh, the buyer ended up emailing her to ask her, hey, what plumbing underneath the house has been replaced? Her response email was all of the plumbing has been replaced. There was then a leak in one of the plumbing that was in the wall. 
And then that was caused $75,000 worth of damage. Oh, man. And then the lawsuit started. Well, what was the lawsuit based on? It was based upon those emails. One email asked what plumbing underneath the house had been replaced. The other email said, sloppily, all of the plumbing has been replaced. Mm -hmm. So the buyer took that to mean all of the plumbing in the house in its entirety had been replaced. And therefore, we had a, a bona fide lawsuit that could have gone all the way to a trial. Yeah. So, My there's client, a so that's where the misunderstanding comes up, but it's also yeah. a major lawsuit. We got that dropped because she had the right company structure in place. But that's what I mean when it's not, there's no intentional fraud there, right? Right. No, I agree with you. And I think there's a huge lesson there to be learned. There's a couple lessons, actually. And, you know, you know the, the one, just being careful about what you're telling people, making sure you're very clear about it. And the second one, is the email and text and voicemail kind of things where you're, you know, doing this and, and, you know, giving people something to look back on and say, so you told me this, you know, when, when a call or something typically isn't going to get recorded. And so you have less of those disputes, but anyway, um, yeah, no, with you my on only, that yeah, my yeah, only experience, paper trail with, down. Yeah. My, my only experience with, with having, you know, somebody uh, do something what was a shady person and it was <clears> a, uh, you know, Melissa was at home. This was early on in her investing and a sheriff came to the front door. And so she was like went white. She was thinking something happened to me, like a crash or something. And they were serving us and, and the neighbor of one of the properties we had flipped was suing us. And, uh, you know, this guy was a complete jerk. And what it was, was trying to say that we had cut his tree branch on the tree in the front yard, two feet over the property line on one branch and was trying to, to get some, well, I don't know, I forgot what it was like 3000 bucks out of us or whatever. And it was just a complete bull crap kind of thing. Yeah. And, you know, he didn't even own the property when we cut the tree branch and he bought it as is. So there wasn't any issue. It was just dropped, but his wife was an attorney or something. And so he didn't even, you know, she's the one that, that filed the suit and all that kind of stuff. But it was, it was just complete garbage. Somebody saw like we made some money and they wanted to get a piece of that real quick. And, yeah, I feel you, man. Like that kind of stuff, unfortunately, happens here in the United States. But I mean, one thing we have to realize and, and, and kind of take into account whenever we're being real estate investors is that we live in the United States, which is the most litigious country in the world, has the most lawsuits of any country in the world. Then we decided to be real estate investors, which among that is the most litigated industry. Well, it is, right? So the one piece we have that we, you know, our research indicates that you have over a 95% probability of being sued as a real estate investor during your life. Wow. The questions that we ask people is, is not if you're going to get sued at some time, because you can't control that. It's when you're going to get sued and what position are you going to be in whenever it happens. And that really is like the nuts and bolts of the end of the day of what, what you're going to be looking at. Right. And, and, and that stuff like that happens exactly like it happened to you. But I mean, I see the stories, all the time. Lawsuits at all different types of levels, right? $3,000, that's a lot of money, right? But I've seen guys lose millions because yeah. they said, oh, I have a, an insurance policy, so I'm fine. And then this other lawsuit ended up creeping up and wiping out huge amounts of their wealth. Oh, wow. one lawsuit. So you want to see somebody age, I mean, that's a really good way. <laughs> I'm like, two years, you age like 10 years. Yeah, I can imagine. That's, well, again, just, that's the hassle of dealing with it, you know? Um, well, everything shuts down, right. like your whole business and your life shut down once you're involved in a major lawsuit. Right. So I had a question too, though. I mean, if you have the two, you know, you have an asset, well, I'm sorry. Yeah. You have like the asset LLC or whatever, then you have the operations one. My question was, and, and this is probably more of a CPA type question, but like, you know, doing the payments, like doing payouts and stuff like that. Are you doing payment checks? you get a loan to buy the house and it's for the LLC that holds the property. And then you hire this contractor from this operations company. Is that asset company writing checks to the contractor? Probably not. Right. Because you don't want the direct, you know, the, the payment, the agreement for the contractors through the operations company. Do you know how that typically works? Yeah. So what you, what you talk, when you're talking about like what company is going to hold what, like a company itself are all born, you know, naked, right? They don't own anything. The only reason they have anything in the world is because we contribute stuff to them. So what happens is, is that you acquire the property, however you're going to acquire the property, right? That either could be like through, um, 
you know, through, directly in the LLC and you'll do some type of commercial financing with that. Or what you end up doing is acquiring the property in your personal name and then transferring it over into your asset holding company. And then there becomes a question of saying, now that I have the asset in there, how am I actually going to be having the money flow around? Mm -hmm. And all of the money is going to be flowing through your operating company. Right. All the money is going to belong to the asset holding company, but it's going to flow through the operating company because that's the one that's contracting with everybody. And you don't want any paper trail that connects your asset holding company to any third party, ideally. So what you do is you just hold all of your cat. You have a, a property, um, you know, an agreement, a contract between these two entities that says, hey, we're going to be a property manager and contractor and work uh, for you on that behalf. And so you'll be holding cash for us. But just like how you would normally with a property management company, how they hold a bunch of cash, but none of it belongs to them. If they're sued, um, all of the money still goes back to the investors. Like if you if somebody sued the property management company, they don't, they don't get to keep all the money that belongs to all these other people. Mm -hmm. That's the legal principle that we're working on. And so then what you would do as, a pro as this LLC is, you know, just keep track of what are the expenditures and whatnot that it's, you know, paying out uh, to everybody. And then after the deal closes or sells or whatever, then, you know, all the cash is distributed out of that LLC, of your operating LLC. Okay. So what about, you know, the asset company is, is now the deed on deed on record as being the owner of the property and something happens. Is there anything, you know, because obviously, so if something happens and they say, well, who's the owner of this property, even though that operation LLC is the one that contracted the work or, or did that kind of thing. How does that work with the actual asset company being the owner of the property? Does that cause any problems or is there any way to, to sort of shield that? Yeah, so we can actually hide the ultimate ownership um, of the company and the asset from anybody being able to find out that it belongs to you or to the company. And we use that, we do that typically by using land trusts. And because land trusts are private documents, then we can hide who actually owns in everything. You know, because what people get stopped is the only thing they're able to find out is that a trust or different trusts or owners of, of, of the piece of property. Um, so that's a really neat piece that we especially use for buy and hold investors. We use a series LLC in combination with anonymous land trusts because that allows us to infinitely compartmentalize for free every single asset and hide all of the ownership, which is the maximum type of protection you can get. Um, however, let's say that if you had a... Um, but if there's still a, like a, a law, let's say that you had, um, you know, a lawsuit against the first property, property A, and that's held by your LLC or your LLC land trust combo. Well, what happened is somebody would sue the trust itself, say like, say grandma fell through the stairs and then the insurance company denied coverage because their stairs were rotten. And they said, oh, actually, that's gross negligence. We're not going to cover that. Um, then, or if you didn't have insurance at all. What they would do is they would turn around and sue the trust as the property holder, and they would be able to attack the property of that trust. They'd be able to attack that one individual piece of property. But this is why we use a series LLC structure, because it's likely, more than likely you have more than one property, right? And so then you would have a series B, a series D, and a series um, C and series D. I don't think I said that right. But anyway, like if, if a lawsuit results against one, it doesn't affect any of the other one. But but the great part about that is, well, I still have one property that's exposed if something happens in connection directly to that property. And, uh, but it also means that they can't come after me and they can't come after the rest of the property. So it's a manageable loss instead of a catastrophic loss. Awesome. So I have a question though about, is there, have there any be, been any cases where, where they've been able to, you know, basically go through and, and demand that they find out who the beneficiary of a trust is and then find out what else they own and, and bring those into the, you know, into the lawsuit. Have you heard of that ever happening? So what will happen is, is they sue the trust itself. And then there's a process called discovery where then they're able to obtain the trust documents. And then once they're able to obtain the trust documents, what they find out is that the trust is actually owned by the LLC. And then the LLC is in turn owned by its own trust. So there's all these layers of protection that come through. Um, so it's really difficult for anybody to find out, um, the ultimate information. However, it's possible through the discovery process to be able to keep requesting court documents as it is relevant to the case. And this particular instance though, 
you you would likely be stopped by the court from being able to find out the ultimate owner of the property because the court would say this isn't relevant who the ultimate owner is we're only talking about you know this individual trust an llc and that's the that's where the liability shield would stop however um you would also need to consider that you know you actually end up having to appear in court a lot of times depending on how that's going to go right so there are some practicalities of this about people being able to find something out but that's really not the type of anonymity where the anonymity becomes important. It's not that nobody could find out anything no matter what they were to sue you and spend $200,000 through a lawsuit, right? What we're really trying to do is mask all of the ownership. Um, so that way it doesn't look like you own anything and it doesn't look like there's a good target to sue, right? If you own everything in your personal name, right. you just created yourself as a target. And that's what we're fighting with is saying, how do we make sure that none of your assets are a target, that your company isn't a target, and that you're not a target. Right. And that, that's kind of where that question came from. So it was saying like, so somebody, you know, something happened and the attorneys think, you know, saying, hey, well, I know this guy does a lot of real estate investing, right? And this property, I guess I don't know if they'd know exactly that it was you, but but it, whatever asset they determined, they, they maybe they even did, you know, where they found out that the trust owned it and then what the beneficiary of the trust and that company is separate by itself or didn't have any other assets. And them saying, well, you know, let's find out what else, you know, the people that own that company own. Does it ever happen that way? They're trying to find where there's more assets because there's not enough yeah, in what they so found. It, but that's part of the litigation fight. And mm -hmm. you're not, you're not privy to that information that has nothing to do with the lawsuit. Lawsuits have to be based upon like, what are the merits of the claim against that? In this case, say the grandma fall into the stairs example, that's the gross negligence of the owner of that piece of property. And so we're suing the owner of that piece of property and the, um, the asset that's exposed is that particular asset. So our LLC is what creates that compartmentalization. That's where the liability would stop is at the LLC level with that, right? So they don't have um, a claim to be able to say that we get to just infinitely ask for discovery above that because that has nothing to do with the claim of grandma falling through the stairs. Oh, okay. Right. So that's where it cuts off of that piece of it. It's no longer relevant. Okay. Right? And all the levels above that. And I've, I've heard before, and this is just secondhand information, investors talking. And uh, I remember who told me, but there, there was talk of, of somebody, you know, a trustee of a land trust being named in a suit but maybe this gets back to your question where they just sue everybody and people end up being yeah. dropped off of it. But the trustee being named in a suit and, and uh, so the company, you know, had a trustee who was actually another company and they had one of their employees sign for that uh, as the trustee uh, for the land trust. And then they got sued and they brought that person in to the lawsuit. Have you heard of that happening? And is that typically something that that kind of, uh, you know, goes away because it wasn't really that person that really had anything. They were just a trustee. Yeah. So likely that they're only going to be able to find liability trustee if the trustee committed some act of fraud. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's very likely the case that the trustee is going to be dismissed from the lawsuit because there's probably not a bona fide claim against the trustee itself. We're also as part of the services that we offer, since we're an all inclusive law firm. So we also offer all of the trustee services mm -hmm. like through us. Right. So if you're worried about that kind of piece of it, we take over all of that function. I mean, cause it increases the anonymity and it says if, you know, if you're sued, we're going to take on that liability. Um, and it's also the piece of it too, is that, you know, we also are highly protective of the structure. So if there's ever lawsuits that come up and you know, what I always tell my clients is we're going to be the first person that's lining up behind you to be able to defend it. If this thing is ever challenged, because I mean, this is like a, it's a quarter million dollar product for us per year that we sell at a minimum, right? So there's a ton of money that's, that's our incentive to make sure that this stuff doesn't um, get attacked in a way that's gonna be successful, so. Smart. <clears throat> so can you explain the series LLC for those that, that don't, maybe haven't heard of that before and, and what exactly that in, involves? Yeah, so if you think about the series LLC, there's one LLC that gets filed with the state. Um, and there's you know 10 plus states where you can file that. Um, you can file it in one state and use it anywhere, just like you would a normal LLC. 
Uh, the difference between a series LLC and a traditional LLC is a series LLC is allowed to create what's called child series. If you think about a parent-child relationship, the parent LLC gets filed with the state. It can create as many child series as it wants, and they're all for free. So literally, you're able to create um, as many legal entities that act just like LLCs for free on your desktop, and they don't have to be filed or anything. You're just able to print off the document and sign it, and now you have a new company under the law that you can operate and do any transaction through. So I've seen guys that from flippers that'll have houses underneath them. I've seen guys that will just have a template document and for each new deal they want to get into, they'll and create a new series. I mean, imagine how cool that is that you can go ahead and almost like breach any contract you want to with impunity because you create a series, that enters into a deal. You decide, nah, I don't really like that deal. They say, hey, I'm going to sue you. You say, great. What do they just sue? Well, it's an empty series. Just like an empty LLC, there's nothing there for them to take. And you can't really get after anything. So there's ways that you can use these legal tools to leverage your ability to do business and make more money and, and be, you know, um, like in a way, like you don't have to be like as careful with everything because you're, the process that you're using takes care of anything that would go wrong. So you're able to just operate a little easier. Yeah, so what, um, so are there any, you know, are there any problems with having LLCs that, that do very little, you know, where no. you have to maybe show meeting minutes and different things to show that it's actually it a true It depends business. where you form, right? So if you form in California, your LLC does about nothing to protect you. If you form it up through Delaware, Nevada, Texas, or Wyoming, um, these states require, um, well, I particularly I like Texas because Texas doesn't have any yearly ongoing requirements for the LLCs. It's free. Um, after the filing, there's no yearly fees associated with it like other states. Um, and so it's, it's really low maintenance and really high protection. But where you form, actually, it matters a lot. Yeah, Texas is awesome on so many levels. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, so let's move on. Let's, um, and so, so sort of like the, the series LLC and having, you know, some investors having the form on their desktop and just creating the LLCs, it's sort of like, what people do with, with land trust as well, because you can just take the document and create it and have the land trust. Yeah. Land trusts though, don't actually provide any protection. They only provide anonymity. So if you sue a land trust, you're still getting back at whoever grant created the land trust. That's why you have to marry the land trust with an LLC. That's, That's the only point. way you get the anonymity and the protection. Nice. That's a good point. All right. So what other nuggets do you have? I mean, what other, you know, great tips for, for, you know, flippers or holders. Um, I mean, if you've got one that you want to share right now, or I've got another question, I can wait on the question. Yeah. I mean, the only other piece that I would say is that like, um, if you're a buy and hold investor is that when you want to look at things is about, you know, when does it start making sense to be able to um, have asset protection put in place for you? And, and what I really look at this is I say, there's the way we set it up at least, is that there's a one-time expenditure that you end up making to be able to protect everything for the rest of your life, right? And so if we're ever making investments that are like that, that are good for the rest of our lives, they almost are always at a really small yearly cost if we assume we're gonna live you know, for, for a while at least, right? So to take that into account, um, and that it's usually what I say is like, it's, long, it's usually around $50,000. Like if you have more than $50,000 in equity, um, or cash or stocks or whatever, you start to have enough money where you're going to be worth doing as an individual and having property. The problem with real estate is that you, d unlike your other at personal assets, is that with real estate, I can actually look in public records to find out how much money I can get from you because I can then know it. And so then it makes you a really attractive target uh, for anybody to come after you. So with the modern you know, way of how properties are escalating and, and prices with equity, um, you, would, you would also expect some other things to happen too, which is if the real estate market turns, right? Or if the, um, the whole U, if the US economy turns, um, every time you have a, a turn in the economy and a downswing in the economy, litigation actually increases because uh, there's less money that people are making. So what they try to do is take it from other people through litigation. And um, when you find that that's going, when you find that's going on, um, <coughs> you would also realize the benefit of saying that 
it's good that I protected myself ahead of time because after a lawsuit is actually filed against you or even threatened against you, it's already too late. Hmm. So these measures only work uh, as proactive steps. They don't work in reverse. Right. Smart. So there's a question about, you know, when you're doing the LOCs and I guess, you know, if you're doing a series LOC or doing something like that, this question probably doesn't, you know, make sense, but sometimes there's a question of, you know, how many properties should I put in? And this probably has a lot of variables too, like how much they're worth and all that kind of stuff. But you recommend, do you recommend sort of one LLC per property or putting in X amount of properties into one LLC if you're holding? Yeah. I, yeah. So I think holding properties, one property per LLC is the old way and the expensive way of doing this. The better way and new way of doing it is using a series LLC structure because it's more efficient. It costs less. It, has less overhead in terms of like what your management needs to be, your tax preparation is easier, everything is better than using a series LLC versus individual LLC. Now there's no reason to do that, except for the fact that you only have one property, then okay, maybe just do a single LLC, right? Mm -hmm. And then that's all you ever plan on having. But like, if you think about this, like even five or 10 years down the line, it's really probably uncommon that anybody's saying like, oh, I'm never gonna, have more than one property. I mean, most of us are investors, so we're thinking, I wanna keep acquiring more. Uh, and if that's the case, then you want a company that's structure that's gonna scale with you, that's gonna be efficient to scale with you. And an LLC isn't that case, because if you have more than one property in an LLC, a lawsuit against any of those properties then exposes all of the assets of the LLC, right? So that's, that's a non-starter and anything else you put in the LLC, right? What I'm suggesting is that we put, create a series LLC with each individual real estate asset held in an individual child series. So, and we move all of our stocks, extra cash, everything into the parent LLC um, or into another individual child series. Either way would work. That way there's no, if somebody could sue us, we're judgment proof. We don't own anything for them to get after. They could sue any one of our individual properties could have liability. Only that property is going to be exposed. Uh, anybody could sue our operating company. We just simply wind down that operating company and start up a new one. Like to protect you from, from all sides on this. And the costs are negligible in terms of the risk of um, being wrong <laughs> on what you think the risk is, right? Because these types of risks with litigation aren't, you're not able to anticipate them. Like there's no good metric of like, I'm an honest person or I prayed five times a day or something like that, that would tell you where you're going to fall into a risk profile, especially if you're, you know, in a, a flipping business, which is anything goes wrong in the house, people are going to sue you. <laughs> like That's just the nature of the, of the business after that. Awesome. So, um, I had a question, but I lost it there. Uh, the, the LLC naming, I think, was a thing, and it's such a minor thing, but like when you're doing a lot of properties and, uh, you know, how are people typically naming all these individual uh, child LLCs with a property address or something like that? Sure. Yeah. It wouldn't matter. Yeah. If you're not going to, if you're going to exclude, if you just said, hey, I'm going to use the parent company, I'm going to file that and then just hold each of the properties directly in the name of the child series, just eliminate the whole trust piece from it then you would just name the child series with the property address. It'd be like worldwide investments, LLC dash series one, two, three main street. All right. So when people set a series LLC up with you guys and then they want to create the child ones, do you guys give them the template document to do that? Or do you recommend that they contact you guys, contact you guys to set up each one of them? Yeah, we give everybody all of the templates. So then at that point, you know, they have all of the documents. So, and that'll be true for the operating agreements and everything, right? We don't do the, we don't try to like hoard documents to make people come back to us. What we find is that a lot of people will just have us do them anyway, mm -hmm. um, because it's just more efficient. They can focus on the deals they're trying to make instead of trying to learn how to modify legal documents, right? Um, but, you know, it's up to you, right? It's whatever you want to do. I, I really don't care. I mean, I'll, I'll set it up and I'll give you all the stuff and you can figure it out on your own from there. I mean, for all I care, like I only care about making sure that you're set up right and that you understand what you're doing to be able to do it on your own if that's what you're going to do. But 
whether you want to use us or not for that is, is really negligible. I mean, there's not enough money in helping people um, from, you know, from a business side of it to try to say that we're going to try to nickel and dime people. I, I just, I think it's annoying and when I've been in that position. And so that's not the way I run my company. Nice. You got any other tips that you want to share with everybody? This has been a very helpful uh, episode, a lot of great information. Do you have anything else that you'd like to share before we close? Yeah, I, the only thing I'd say is that um, the couple of key points on this one is that with the new taxes that are coming through, if you running everything through your company structure for passive investments is going to give you that 20% tax deduction um, that previously wasn't available that you're going to have now in 2018 if you have your company structure set up. Um, all of the taxes with the series LLC pass through one EIN number. So it's going to be a completely disregarded entity for tax purposes, which makes your end of year tax, there's no separate filing you have to do for that. Um, you'll, it's really easy to add your insurance to, um, to an LLC. You just keep the existing insurance policy in place and then add your LLC as an additional insured or your trust as an additional insured whenever you're moving the property over. Um, transfers to the land trust from your personal name. If, if that's what you're having to do to own property in your personal name and you want to transfer it over, those transfers are not going to trigger the due on sale clause because it's just transferred to a trust, which doesn't trigger the due on sale clause. Whereas a transfer to LLC directly would, that's our workaround for that. Nice. Um, and the whole piece of this is you're able to hold everything all in one bank account for all of the money for your asset holding company, as long as you're keeping accurate accounting records for each individual property. And that's just really tracking the income and expenses for each property. We can hold all the money in one bank account as long as we could tell the court, this is how we know which money belongs to which company. It's the same principle that um, property management companies work off of, where they have one big pool of money, but they have accurate accounting. Nice. And that takes care of that operation, like the, the cash flow from the one that's owning the asset versus the one that's operating, doing the operations. That's right. Yeah. Nice. All right, man. This is Scott. This has been awesome. I, I, I'm going to reach out to you for, for some more stuff as, as I have questions for him for what we're doing here in our business. And I recommend others that are listening to this show, if you do have any of these questions or want to start doing these kind of things, contact Scott. So how can they find you? How can they contact you? Yeah, so you'll want to come to the royallegalsolutions.com website, and we have a contact form on there uh, for everybody to reach out. Then, uh, Or you can email me at scott at royallegalsolutions.com, uh, or you can call us at 512-757-3994. Uh, Danny, I'm going to send you some freebies and the show notes, like the top 10 things every real estate investor must do to protect their assets. Um, as well as a, as a link for people to be able to get access to um, all of our great legal services. That's correct. awesome. I appreciate that. I'll put that on the show notes for everybody listening. You can go to flippingjunkie.com slash 102. Flippingjunkie.com slash 102. Get all that free stuff and information from Scott. Thanks a lot, Scott. Do you have anything else that you want to say? That's awesome, Danny. No, just everybody keep making money. I'm happy to help you if you, uh, if you guys need it. Awesome. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Thanks, guys.